Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Mr. Atarani. I'm uh, one of the senior clinical fellows in the upper GI and bariatric surgery at Southwold Royal. Uh, I'll give you a brief talk about uh, the bariatric operations that we offer at uh, Southwold Royal. Uh, it's no much details in the presentation, but definitely at the when you reach to the stage of the operation, okay, you'll. Uh, <clears throat> You'll find all the all the details in the in the clinic or in the meetings with the surgeons, with the uh, with the medics, with the uh, dietitians and the bariatric nurses. So uh, we can start. I'll, I'll start. I'll use some charts to just to explain what we do and what's the outcome that we expect. What are the pros and cons of some uh, operations? Uh, so. Uh, Stevie, are you controlling my presentation or can I go next? Yeah, I'm controlling it. So if you just give me an order, say next, yeah, so I'll yeah. move it along. Next, please. Yeah. Okay. So just one second. Yeah. So to start with, just a, a brief idea bariatric surgery is also referred to as a weight loss surgery or metabolic surgery is the treatment option for people with severe obesity. So it's the, the treatment that achieves the best long-term outcome uh, in, in comparison to other, other modalities of treatment of the obesity, such as, such as dieting or lifestyle changes. Uh, it shouldn't be seen uh, as, a, as a standalone procedure. It should be a part of comprehensive approach, which include lifestyle management, uh, uh, a follow up and uh, compliance with medications, compliance with advice, with advices uh, from the medical team or the surgical team. Okay, in addition to the uh, supplementation and new monitoring of the nutritional status. Yeah, next, please. So, how the surgery works? So, to start with, most of the surgeries are performed uh, by a keyhole operations. Okay, that gives you. Uh, a faster recovery, less pain, less complications related to the to the wound. So keyhole operation usually we do uh, four to five one centimeter stops that we go, we put the instruments through and we do the operation through uh, uh, without a big cut through the abdominal wall. Uh, the most bariatric, the most common bariatric surgery procedure performed in UK and all over the world are the uh, gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. And that is the case in, uh, in Salford Royal. Other less common procedures include the, the gastric band or single anastomosis uh, bypass and biliopancreatic, biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch, which almost we, we do not offer. This is, it has uh, its own specific indications. Uh, next, please. So we'll continue with the how it works. Bariatric procedure were initially designed to cause weight loss by restricting the amount of food that can be eaten and by causing malabsorption after bypassing a certain amount of the, of the bowel. Uh, but it found later that it also uh, alters the signals that come from the gut to the brain, which in turn control the appetite, interest in food, taste, and the blood sugar. So your interest, your appetite, your, your hunger will be, will be much, uh, much less and to, to, to the favorable side after the operation. So it's not as simple as just restricting the amount of food that you're taking. Uh, so it's a little bit deeper than that, which is on the, on the, on the good side for the outcome. Uh, the, then they lead to change in the signals from the gut, including increasing appetite, Suppressing, suppressing signals and reducing the appetite, stimulating signals, uh, which we call the, the hunger hormone that is secreted from the, a certain part of the stomach that we either excise and take it out or exclude it. So in bariatric operations, you, you are expected to have much less hunger after the, after the operation. Uh, le next, please. So the surgical options that are as I said, various surgical options to choose from uh, uh, when considering the bariatric surgery. 
And if you are considering bariatric surgery, definitely you'll have a discussion of the pros and cons, risks and benefit of the surgery and what is the most suitable for you because there's no one size fits all. Uh, the everyone, every uh, one would have a, a, a procedure that that is more suitable. The the options that uh, that are available are the, uh, the gastric bypass in in the two form is either, either the two joints or a single joint bypass the sleeve gastrectomy, and the the gastric band is also is also an, an, an option, but we do not normally offer at Salford Royal. Uh, it has, again, it has a, a, a very uh, specific indications, but it was, was very popular around 15 to 20 years ago, but with, with all the complications, with the, with the outcome that is suboptimal in comparison to the other surgical procedures, we tend not to offer the gastric band at this stage. Yeah, next, please. Uh, to start with, this is just a, a brief idea about the, the gastric band. Uh, uh, the adjustable gastric band is just the inflatable band that is placed around the top part of the stomach. It will create a small, pa small pouch above the band uh, and separate uh, from the, the stomach below. So the, ba the band, Will, will create some sort of a barrier between the top of the stomach and the rest of the stomach. So the food will sit there. Uh, when you eat the food will, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer. So the food will sit there and the, and the pouch above the band and that will give you a feeling of full that you cannot eat more and you need to give it time to go through the narrowed part of the stomach underneath the band. Uh, it gives, it gives outcome of around, you can lose uh, around 50% of the excess weight loss uh, in the first 20, 24 months or after, but this is not guaranteed and there is a, a good percentage of patients that they never lose weight, uh, but they, they are, this is not the majority. They, it, it gives, it gives if in, in a certain aspects, it gives uh, a fairly good amount of weight loss. But the, the problem is the, the, the follow-up that is, uh, we can say that it's demanding, uh, especially on the side of the patient that needs frequent visits to the to the clinic for adjustment, inflation or deflation. And on the long term, we we observe we start to observe that it has its own complications, and it has a significant number of complications, like the band erosion into the stomach or band. Uh, slippage or band obstruction, in addition to the to the complications related to the to the port, such as infection or the port itself can be flipped. The port, I mean the port, the part of the band that is underneath the skin that we inject the fluid to inflate uh, the the band. Uh, in addition, as I said, that the outcome is is suboptimal and is. Uh, much less favorable in comparison to the to the sleeve and the bypass. So at the at the moment we do not offer the gastric band and we do not advise uh, to get the the gastric band, uh, considering the availability of other surgical options with more favorable uh, side effect uh, profile and a more favorable outcome. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, uh, the next please yeah okay the gastric bypass the gastric bypass uh, as a whole term it has two forms the raw in y gastric bypass or the two joints gastric bypass the other one that i will talk uh, uh, about shortly is the single joint gastric bypass so starting with raw in y gastric bypass as is as it is here in this diagram it, it it started, it's a procedure that has been performed since 1960, so it's a more than 50 year old uh, operation that is, it gives you a bit of assurance about the long term outcome uh, of this operation. It involves stapling across the stomach to create a, a small pouch, which is just like a size of an egg or 50 ml pouch. That will be the new stomach. This new stomach will be joint to the to the mid part of the bowel the rest of the stomach remains inside you but the food doesn't go there so that that part will be excluded 
the, the small intestine will be replumbed, creating a short cut from the new stomach to the mid part of the small bowel, bypassing the first part, or uh, it's, it will be around a meter of, or a meter, uh, one meter to two meters of the, of the proximal or the, the first part of the small intestine. That will be reflected on the absorption of the nutrients. So the, the, the food will be exposed to the bowel and to the body secretions that help in the absorption in after the mid part of the small bowel. And that will give you less absorption of, of the nutrients and that will be reflected on the calories that you take. Next slide, please. So it works by several mechanisms. Most importantly, it, it, what it does is the rerouting of the food stream alters the gut signal leading to increased satiety, a reduced hunger, change in taste and improved uh, blood sugar. The newly created stomach pouch is considerably smaller and facilitate significantly smaller meals, which translate into less calorie intake. On average, <clears throat> if the patients are expected to lose 20 to 30 percent of their total body weight. That, that is from the total body weight. And if we look for the excess body weight, you're expected to lose between 70 to 80 percent of the excess body weight over the first over the uh, the first one to two years, it requires adherence to dietary recommendation, lifelong vitamin and mineral supplementation, and follow up compliance because we bypassed the part of the bowel that absorbs these essential uh, nutrients. So you need to take them at lifelong uh, nutritional supplementation in the form of tablets for the vitamins and minerals. Uh, it can be reversed if, if required, uh, but that is um, that's rarely needed. Uh, smoking significantly increased the risk associated with this operation. So you need to be non-smoker at the time of the operation because it creates a lot of issues that include uh, ulceration at the joint, at the joint part, ulceration may heal with scar and cause stenosis, the ulcers may, may bleed and may, may cause a lot of issues. So it's not for smokers and the, the patient should be a non-smoker when, when we go to the, when we reach the stage of the operation. Next slide, please. Uh, the other option is sleeve gastrectomy. As the diagram shows that we we excise around 75% of the, of the stomach and the new stomach will be a tube-like going from the gullet down to, to the bowel. Uh, it, it's been started to as a standalone procedure since 2008. Uh, as I said, the, the, we excise 75% of the stomach and the rest of the gastrointestinal tract remain untouched. Next, please. The surgery again alters the gut signals that regulate appetite because the flow of food through the, through the tubularized stomach is much faster than the, when it was a bag-like. So it goes down and it sends signals to the brain they, that initiate that decrease appetite to change taste and blood sugar. The new stomach holds considerably smaller volume than the normal stomach and helps significantly reduce the amount of food and the calorie intake. Uh, medium and short-term short studies show that sleeve is as effective as the gastric bypass in terms of weight loss and improvement of remission of uh, diabetes. So it's, 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 uh, it's marginally, just marginally, less effective than the bypass, but it gives a quite good outcome on the, on the health issues associated with the obesity and the, and the, uh, the weight loss. Uh, on average, people lose 20 to 30% of the, of the total body weight after surgery. Okay, and if we look at the excess body weight loss, it's expected to be between 60 to 70% uh, over the, uh, the first two years after the operation. It, again, uh, the same with the bariatric with other bariatric operations, it requires 
adherence to dietary recommendation, lifelong vitamin and mineral supplementation, and follow-up compliance. The surgery is irreversible because we the, the excised part of the stomach uh, it will be taken out of the of the body and then used the, the, the remaining part will be the, the only one available for the food to go through. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another form of gastric bypass we call one anastomosis gastric bypass. And uh, sometimes it's been referred to as mini gastric bypass. Mini is, is for, for technical reasons, but it's not mini in the outcome or the requirement. So it's not um, mini in the side effects. So mini is just it's a technical term that it's a one joint bypass in comparison to a two joint bypass. So the one anastomosis bypass is relatively new. It's been it's been started to to be performed around uh, twenty years ago. Uh, it involves stapling of the stomach, starting from uh, the lower part, uh, to create a long pouch up to the gullet. Uh, the rest of the stomach remains in the body, but again, it's excluded, so the food doesn't go there. This pouch of the of the stomach, okay, small pouch of the stomach, is joined to the to the bowel around 150 centimeter to 200 centimeter uh, uh, after the away from the the bottom of the stomach so again we're bypassing a good amount of the bowel and that will be reflected on the amount of the the nutrient that the patient uh, absorb uh, so the the diagram is explains how how it looks from the from the inside uh, next slide, please. Uh, few research studies have examined the changes after this operation, but it's thought to work mainly through, uh, again, altering the, the gut signals, which control appetite, taste, blood sugar, and also through restricting the size of the stomach. So it works with the same mechanism as the two joint bypass. The replumbing means that the bile content can pass into the stomach and the, and the food pipe. Uh, and because the, the, the part of the stomach that we created is joined to the bowel next to the flow of the bile. So there would be a percentage of patients that who have symptoms related to the bile going into the, into the stomach and or even into the, into the gullet. Uh, at the moment, it's unclear whether this might increase the risk of a stomach cancer. As I said, it's a, a 20 year old operation. So we can't comment on the long-term outcome uh, till we have a well-established long-term uh, studies based on long-term uh, follow-up. Uh, on average, people people lose 25 to 30 percent of their total body body weight. So uh, it's not less uh, in the in the outcome on the on the weight loss not less than the, the, the other bypass. The one anastomosis gastric bypass, again, required adherence to dietary recommendation, lifelong and vitamin mineral supplementation, and uh, follow-up compliance. The indications of the, of the one anastomosis bypass, uh, sometimes, as I said, because if there's one joint, okay, it's less technically challenging. And sometimes we put it as a backup plan if we cannot because of, of the intra-abdominal fat, because of uh, uh, technically, if we are unable to, to proceed with two joints, we can, uh, we can go for a, for a single joint uh, bypass because it, it takes less time and it takes less technical, it's less technically demanding than the, than the two joint bypass, but it, it gives the, the same outcome. And one of her main drawbacks is that some patient may feel reflux, either acid or bile reflux, after the procedure that may require another surgical intervention. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, that was a brief uh, presentation about the technical aspects of the of the uh, surgical options that we offer to treat uh, obesity. And I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, any question in regard to, to the operation that we do. Perfect. Thanks so much, Mr. Alterani. 
Um, if every all of the panellists would mind popping their cameras back on, um, we can take this opportunity to um, do some introductions. So I think it'd be really helpful if we give your kind of um, your position and the hospital that you work at, and then we can direct questions from there. So, um, Tom, would you be happy to go first? Hi, yeah. Um, yeah. I Oh. I'm Tom, I'm a bariatric dietitian and I work at Castle Hill Hospital the majority of the time. Hi Tom, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Mohammed. Okay, would you like to go next? Hi, I'm Beverly. I am a weight management practitioner and psychotherapist and I work for More Life. Marie? Hi, I'm Marie. I'm with the Castle Hill team um, in Hull and East Riding, and I'm the psychological therapist with the team. Thanks, Marie. Um, Claire, are you unable to turn your video back on? <clears throat> Stevie, I can't start mine. It says host um, has stopped my video, so I can't restart mine. Hold me a second. <laughs> um... Hi, so I'm Jodie. I'm the bariatric nurse at Salford Royal. Thank you, Mo, for that presentation. Um, I really like the pictures. They're, they're, they were really good to show how the differences in the bypasses are formed. Um, so I hope everyone found that useful. Um, we'll go back to the introductions. We've got them back there, so that's great. <laughs> thanks, Jodie. Uh, thanks, Jodie. Mr. Pellin? Hi, I'm Mike Pellin. I'm a consultant upper GI and bariatric surgeon at Castle Hill Hospital. So that's part of the Hull, and Hull University Teaching Hospitals Trust. Um, and yeah, I form part of the tier four bariatric service um, in our region alongside two of my consultant surgeon colleagues, Mr. Peter Sedman and Mr. Prashant Jain. All right, nice to meet you. Hi there. Hello, I still can't join, unfortunately, Jodie. You're here, you're here, Claire. Hi, <laughs> okay. you, Claire. Hi. I can hear you, we can see you. Oh, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> your, your role, Claire? Yeah, I'm Claire Hunt, bariatric specialist nurse, and I work at Castle Hill Hospital um, with the rest of the team. Wonderful. Uh, you do keep disappearing, um, but you are popping up. Um, <laughs> and then, okay. uh, Mr. Altuani, do you want to just... Remind everybody of your role. Sorry? Do you want to just remind everybody of your role and then we'll get stuck into the q and A's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Mr. Mohamed al -Tarani. I'm one of the senior fellows in the upper GI and bariatric surgery at uh, Salford Royal. Thanks very much. He's been very Thanks, modest. Sir. He's the right-hand man of our surgeons and uh, seemed to be a consultant surgeon himself. So first of all, I know quite a few people Thank have you. said that it's their first time um, joining the session this evening. So um, as the pandemic hit us, we very quickly moved to these Zoom sessions facilitated by Stevie and her team at ABL. So that's fantastic. Um, so if you're a little bit overwhelmed thinking, oh, I was hoping I might just get to chat to a few other people thinking about doing surgery and you look at the participant number down there hitting 210. And um, that's why we, we uh, do the evening as we do. So there's always an informative section at the beginning. So today we've talked about surgeries. Then there's opportunity to ask question and answers. The topic is different every month. So don't worry if yours doesn't get answered. It might be that we're going to keep that back for when we're doing that topic. Um, so I think given that the, we have quite a large panel today, it's really nice to have another bariatric team joining us. Most of you are um, in the weight management service in readiness to be referred over to Salford. Um, and some of the people here are, are part of the process that will be referred on to the team at East Riding. Um, but we all come from the same, uh, cut from the same cloth as it were. We'll all be able to help you with questions um, around bariatric surgery. So I'll let Stevie um, hit us with the first questions. <laughs> Jump in there if you've got the best answer. Um, so um, somebody's asked, um, you mentioned in your talk there, Mr. Altuani, that um, people shouldn't be smoking um, when they come for surgery, but somebody's asking, is that vaping too or just for cigarettes? Uh, uh, actually, the 
it's, it's hard to, to, to find uh, an easy answer for this. But so far, the latest statements on this, that vaping should be dealt with uh, similar in a similar manner to the, uh, to the smoking. Okay, uh, so far all the literature says that it can give the same impact and the same risks to the, to the cigarette smoking. So we would prefer patients to stop all forms of smoking at the time of the before the time of the operation. Thank you. Does anybody want to come in with a reason why we shouldn't be smoking? I think that's quite um, that's quite powerful, isn't it? Yeah. It, why shouldn't why shouldn't we smoke? What's yeah. the reason that somebody shouldn't be smoking? Um, yeah, smoking it affects, it affects the, the the level of level oxygenation of in the body. Okay. It also has it has a lot of side effects, but specifically talking about the the surgical aspect or the tissue, it affects the tissue healing. Okay, it affects the lining of the stomach, and the most vulnerable areas to be affected of this are the joint uh, points in the uh, that are created at the time of the operation. Okay, so these are it, it would be more sensitive than the rest of the of the lining of the stomach, so that will predispose patient to have ulceration. Okay, on the, that is on the long term, and on the short term, it, as I said, affect, it affects the healing at the joint point that they, so it will put patient under risk of uh, impaired healing and leak uh, at the joint points. Okay, in addition to the to unhealthy lungs are not easy to recover, they will be exposed to risk of a chest infections, uh, a longer stay in the hospital. In addition to the full profile, of course, of the uh, of the risks of the smoking, but I'm talking about specifically about the the operation. So things can be can be complicated. Ulcer can bleed, can cause uh, uh, narrowing or stenosis when they healed with a scar. So that that's why uh, procedure that may that may involve uh, uh, a joint are not for smokers. Sorry, I can't hear you, Stevie. Oh, nobody can hear me. We can yeah, hear, you I can now. hear you now. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure why. Um, I said, does anybody want to add anything there from the panel? No. No. Okay. So, um, Catherine's asked, um, why do we not do the band anymore? Um, she's really worried about having an intrusive surgery. So, Mr. Pellin, do you want to maybe take that one? Um, yes, I can do. Um, so, the gastric band procedure historically was very popular because it was relatively straightforward to perform. It could be performed almost as a day case procedure. Um, there was minimal uh, sort of injury, one thought initially to the stomach tissues because you didn't need to divide the stomach tissue. You didn't need to separate it or join it onto anything else. There was a small wrap effect of the top of the stomach or the fundus, the top bit of the stomach, just to try and reduce the, the belt effect of that band slipping or tilting. And it all seemed great. And then as time passed and we had the hindsight of long-term follow-up, which we now have 10, 15 years down the line, what we've discovered is those bands cause several problems. They cause problems for patients with symptoms, particularly um, intolerance of a normal diet. When you have weight loss surgery, you want to be on a normal diet. You don't want to be on a liquid diet. You don't want to be on some funny regime. You want to be eating smaller portions of a balanced meal and separating fluid from that meal. That's what you want, okay? You're going to live the rest of your life after this procedure. What happened is a lot of people found that they were yo-yoing in a new way between getting their band tightened a bit and loosened their band that led to them having problems with dysphagia as we call it or food sticking or they'd have problems with lack of restriction so they were going between the two please can I have a bit more in my band please can I have a bit taken out of my band that then led to what we call maladaptive eating so patients would essentially start liquidizing usual meals relying on soups shakes and that led to an insidious, a gradual weight regain. So the disappointing effect for patients was they had a heck of a lot of symptoms of these intolerance of the normal diet they'd be eating, and then they'd get weight gain. So 
that then added to another background problem which was discovered which was the foreign body the fact that something you know that is not natural was inside your body was essentially very close to a hollow soft structure your stomach or your gullet and what that then meant is that the band started to potentially tilt or even erode into the stomach lining now we've seen this with experience of lots of foreign materials placed into people's bodies but it seemed okay at first. It was a soft silicon ring and it seemed to be less sort of intrusive to the tissues. But over time, we've seen the band erode or displace or in fact become stiffer over time. So even taking all the fluid out of your band didn't actually release this very tight effect of the band. So what that's ultimately led to, we've got international evidence on this now it's not just England we now see that one in three at least patients seek to have their band taken out so what you've got in summary with a band operation is symptoms for the patient a high risk of weight regain and a high risk of revisional surgery a one in three chance minimum of you going through yet another operation to have the band taken out and when you weigh that up against the effect that it didn't do a brilliant job in the first place because the excess weight loss was on average about 50%, which no way near compares to the sleeve or the bypass, which we've talked about today, then it's a bad deal for patients. And although some surgeons will contest that and they're welcome to do so, and they will still provide that surgery, our preference at Castle Hill Hospital is to not recommend that because, you know, if we don't learn from experience of the past, we're not really doing a great service for our patients. So that's our standpoint. Um, if anybody has any other feelings on that, I'm welcome to discuss it. You know, I'm not, I'm not the law on this, but, you know, we, we do sort of, um, we refer to lots of experiences of our own patients and, evidence and experience of our colleagues around the country that's how we've reached our conclusion on this yeah yeah i, I think that's that's a comp comprehensive answer it's just one uh, tiny thing to add that uh, it doesn't affect hunger okay so you can't eat but you're still hungry okay that is in comparison to the other operations they get they change the signals from the gut to the brain the band doesn't so it's it's just the, the, this is this is not a good feeling to have that you're hungry but you cannot eat. That is one of the the main drawbacks of the of the band. In addition to what uh, what Michael just said. Well, the next questions are centered around excess skin. So the first part of this question is: um, Is excess skin removed on the NHS? So I, I can take that one. So unfortunately, no, there isn't a commission service, which means money for people to have um, excess skin removal after bariatric surgery. And it's something that comes up time and time again in our post-operative group. Um, it's a difficult thing to deal with, um, uh, to live with excess skin. And it's something you do need to think about prior to surgery. Um, for some people, uh, they think, well, if I go to the gym lots, then I, then I won't. I'm afraid it, it doesn't really have a lot to do with that. It does help if you go to the gym for lots of reasons, but not necessarily going to get rid of that excess skin for you. Um, so it is a definite consideration. I know when we've done our patient experience nights, we had, um, I don't know if anyone joined last uh, month. So we had the young gentleman, very young gentleman, um, who lost a considerable a, massive amount of weight um, and he is saving and planning to have the um, excess skin removal because as a young man it's something he's struggling um, to live with long term um, and that's no small undergoing the operation itself is perhaps um, as big and, and, and still has risks carried with it um, as, as bariatric surgery. Um, so this was always part of his plan and part of his journey um, and that's something that he's considering next he in when he balances it all now now that he's lost so much of his weight he is absolutely delighted that he did um the bariatric surgery but it was always in his mind as a young man going back out there feeling a lot more confident um that he didn't want to live with the excess skin forever and then we had the other gentleman um Stuart who's a little bit older and as he says I've, I've got my wife I'm not out there on the market um he, he really wasn't too fussed about his excess skin at all for him um he he just felt 
felt that, yeah, it's a reminder of where he's come from. Um, he's proud of his weight loss and the excess skin compared to the health benefits is nothing to him at all. Um, so it's, it's an interesting thing and, and something that you do need to consider because bariatric surgery is a process and living with bariatric surgery afterwards um, is it's all a journey with its ups and, it, uh, and its downs. That's great, Jodie. Can I also um, say that I've spoken to Marie, we have discussions about this quite um, a few times. I've had a handful of patients that is, this has been really, really troublesome to them. Um, and I think it's really important, like you say, there's no sort of, you can't guess who will and who won't get the excess. But I think it's really important that patients look at pictures on the internet to sort of realise what they can experience after the bariatric surgery, because it does cause problems sometimes with some patients and their relationships. I don't know if you've found that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think as you go through the process, and that's part of the reason you're in weight management for a while as well, um, just yeah. so you really are aware. Is that Jodie frozen, not me? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, yeah. Up. Um, so this question is probably for Marie and Beverly. So um, I, there's a client here that's asked, how common is body dysmorphia after surgery? I know you guys deal with the pre, um, pre-surgery kind of side of things, but do you have um, an answer to that question? We deal uh, at Castle Hill, we deal with, with pre and post. Um, so we do screenings beforehand and, and we're around for follow up for up to two years afterwards. Um, I, I think the, the problem there is is probably more on the on the pre side um, in terms of sort of trying to screen for that um, before the operation. So again, what we what we look at with there, we're, we're very keen, I think, at Castle Hill that um, people are on the programme and we're there to sort of optimise them getting ready for surgery. So we're able to to offer some work up um, going towards the surgery. I think. Um, Body dysmorphia is definitely, definitely on a bit uh, on a bit of a spectrum, really. So, so quite a mild, mild part at one end to sort of very severe at the other end. Um, and I think certainly from my perspective, when I'm screening um, people for suitability for surgery, if if they're at the very severe end, what I might want to do is um, get them into sort of local services, have that treatment, have that therapy, have the BDD treated, and then to, to come back. If they're on the milder end of the spectrum, I might do that work myself and they stay within the, the pathway within Castle Hill. It's, it's difficult to sort of just um, say one size fits all really with that. Um, afterwards, um, after the surgery, I think there is, um, uh, again, it's it's a little bit complex because I think um, it, it ties in with sort of um, body image, whether you would class it as body dysmorphia um, would depend on the individual, but there are some people that um, don't recognize the weight that they've lost. Um, and I think that can tie in with sort of eating disorders as well. Um, and f for me, it's very much about taking the individual person and, and working with what they're presenting with. Yeah, I think I agree with everything you said. Yeah, I think I agree with everything you've said, Marie. I think I think the significant thing is really that you're likely to pick up people who are more likely to develop or already have body dysmorphia, body image struggles pre-surgery. Um, I work with quite a lot of clients, so I'm, we do some one-to-one -one therapy for anybody who comes up with struggling with body image at all. We're starting to look about including that in the programme anyway for everybody um, to try and reduce the significance of, of that post-surgery. I also think, sorry, I, I also think this ties in with the, the other question about the excess skin, um, because again, if you've got body image um, difficulties before you have the surgery, it's very, very likely that you're going to struggle with the excess skin after the surgery. And I think people come, certainly when we see them in that first clinic, they're excited, they've waited a long time to get there, they feel that they've sort of done lots and lots of work to get there. Um, and I think um, they just try and sort of... Um, hear everything they possibly can about the surgery but you're given such a lot of information in a tiny short space of time um that uh yeah i think it's something that needs really thinking about beforehand 
that he feels like um, the description that's been given today makes this seem like a really major operation um, and he wondered what the risk was associated with the operations. Yeah, I, I can take this question. So the risk of operation, so uh, it, it, as it is in any in any major operation, it's not it's not a small intervention. So uh, it's not a minor intervention. So it's uh, we can say it's a, it's an, a big operation, but it's fairly safe. But as it is the case in any in any operation under general surgery, there are risks that generic for an operation such as bleeding, pain, infection, injury to internal organ, and there's always a, a tiny chance to convert to to open cut uh, operation. Okay, whenever it is safer for the patient, uh, uh, there are always risks specific for the for each uh, option of the surgical interventions, uh, such as for for the bypass. There is a risk of always a, a small risk of uh, of anastomotic leak or leak at the joint or non-healing at the joint uh, part, but that is uh, less than one percent. Uh, there is always risk of. Uh, of a dumping, but sometimes it, it helps in the uh, dumping syndrome and it helps in the control of the weight and control of the eating behavior afterward. Uh, there are risks of, as I said, uh, ulceration or uh, narrowing at the, at the joint uh, point. Uh, on the long term, it's it, it, the requirement of the of the supplementation you need to be to adhere to and to be compliant with, with the supplementation there would be some risks of uh, malnutrition need for uh, <clears throat> more extensive supplementation uh, there is a risk specific if you if you go uh, uh, google or some websites of course you you find a risk of uh, herniation or internal herniation because we change the configuration of the bowel we create a new shape of the bowel that create a new opening inside the abdomen the bowel can sneak over there that it's, that is between one to three percent. We do our best to, to to decrease the risk of this, but sometimes when when the when the weight loss happens and when the fat dissolves these or small tiny openings, they may get bigger and the bowel may sneak into there. We we explain to the patient what would be the symptoms, what are the what are the expectations about this. We do uh, close these defects and we keep monitoring the patient for any symptoms suggestive of this. This is for the in 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 general care for. The bypass uh, for the for the sleeve again the same general risks for any operation like bleeding pain infection things specific for the bypass again leak at the staple line again it's it's a minority and it happens in, in less than one percent uh, in in our experience in, in the center some in in the literature all over the world it can go up to uh, a little bit more than that uh, um, uh, on the uh, there can be risk of uh, narrowing or need for stretch of the of the sleeve uh, on the long longer term there can be risk of uh, of acid reflux because we narrow the stomach it, it's a smaller so the acid may go up to the gullet and they may need to to have another operation for that if it is not responding to uh, to medical treatment uh, this is just an uh, 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 general idea about the, the risk and of course of course it, 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 there would be uh, a, a tiny risk to life as it is the case in any major operation but is uh, internationally it's less than 1.08 but it, it, it is there that the, the and the patient would be aware of of that but we in general we can it's just you, you need to weigh the, the benefits and risks of the uh, of the operation and uh, in in most of the patients the benefits far outweigh the risks of the procedure thank you um, so tom this next question is for you um, so natalie has said can you explain exactly what happens or how it feels when dumping syndrome occurs yeah yeah, so, so um, dumping syndrome is uh, something we associate largely with gastric bypass, although we do sometimes see it with some of the other surgeries as well, uh, such as sleeve gastrectomy. But effectively, it's what happens when food moves too rapidly from your stomach into your small intestine. 
basically uh, fluids and salts move into the small intestine and out of the blood and that can affect that can make you feel very lightheaded can make you feel very funny people often get pale shaky and it can cause some low blood sugars and it can cause some, some diarrhea as well it most commonly happens when people have foods which are very high in fats or sugary carbohydrates but can happen for some people on different foods as well um, it's generally not severe most people find what foods trigger it fairly quickly and just avoid those trigger foods for themselves um, and why i was remind people is it, it's, it's a little bit unpleasant but it's not actively harmful so if it does happen you might feel a bit bit unwell for half an hour or so but there shouldn't be any kind of major long-term side effects from it Oh, Steve, you, 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 I don't know if you're muted, but I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? That's better, yeah. My sound keeps dropping off, so I do apologise. Um, so I'm not sure who this question is best suited for, so just shout out. Um, but if the surgery changes GLP, GLP-1 signals, would a patient on semeglutide need to stop taking this medication? Did I? anybody there's tumbleweeds i'll be happy to, to start off but <laughs> so, so, someone else jump in if they think if they want to, want to add anything um so not necessarily is the answer um so the operation will increase your body's own production of glp1 but the glp1 medications which are out there do work slightly differently they're designed to last around in the body for quite a lot longer than our own natural glp1 so our own natural glp1 is very broken down very quickly by enzymes in our blood and the uh, the injectable ones such as uh, uh Bieta, Levagtide, Victoza, Saxenda, now is an obesity medication that's come out, um, Zempic, all these ones have been modified so that they stay a lot longer in the blood. So some, pa some people might still require that in terms of their diabetes control, uh, and it might still be advisable for them to continue. However, having said that, we would hope that if you have type 2 diabetes when you have the operation that we would get some significant improvements in your type 2 diabetes uh, so you may be able to reduce it but of course not everybody does diabetes is a large, large spectrum disease um, and some people will, will come off a lot of medications and some people will stay on them for longer or even permanently following the surgery so it, it, it does vary from case to case now i just add a little uh, sort of additional point here as well in our units we have obviously as many units do we have an endocrinologist forming part of our core bariatric mdt essentially all of our bariatric patients get a bespoke plan so they're told both pre-operatively during that time when they are effectively you know they're effectively having a very significant reduced calorie intake for two weeks during that time they go on a regime of what to do with their diabetes medication they're also, we have to be very careful, of course, because these new types of diabetes medications, you simply can't stay on them when you're fasting. You can't, if you're not having anything to eat, you can't be on that drug. You have to stop it. So we have to have a very careful plan for those patients. And then, of course, during their introduction of their liquid diet and going and moving through those first few weeks up to a textured diet, they need to know as an individual what they're doing with their drugs because they're very individual to them um so what i would say is if that is a medication that affects you ask questions closer to the time so that you you know and you're on the radar of um of a specialist diabetologist or dis discuss it with your diabetologist as well so that they can you know keep in touch with your weight loss surgery team if it comes to that yeah, Castle Hill, Mike, as well. I don't know if you know, actually, we've just actually got a, um, a perioperative um, diabetes practitioner as well. So she's going to be coming along board and helping support patients in the um, preoperative stage in relation to their diabetes to optimise them as well. So that will be helpful for everybody. Yeah, but I can just add, absolutely, um, teams support people who have diabetes so you know what you're doing with your medications. But let's not underplay just how exciting bariatric surgery is 
and what can happen with your diabetes afterwards. Um, so the scientific world acknowledge um, that uh, bariatric surgery can put your diabetes into remission. So if you have type two diabetes, particularly if you've been recently diagnosed, hopefully after bariatric surgery, you're gonna be on a completely different pathway and very quickly after surgery. So we've had studies that have shown as little as seven days after surgery, people no longer um, require uh, medications um, in the long term. So that's why we monitor you and that's why follow-up is so important. Um, but yes, yeah, so if you have type two diabetes, um, when you come to meet your bariatric team, they'll all be very excited to tell you about the options, which ones might work best for you. And um, so do keep that open mind all the way through this, because uh, we'll give you our expertise on what surgery we think would suit you, as well as perhaps surgeries that you've looked at and think might be a good idea as well. No, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, so this question is probably for Jody and Claire, but lots of people are asking how long after the surgery can they return to exercise? Somebody's asked specifically around um, swimming, but generally, so if somebody was already doing resistance training, lifting weights in the gym, how long could we would they need to wait to return to their normal exercise regimes? I guess it's suppose what they were doing beforehand. So um, we generally say sort of around six weeks time um, and to gradually start with their exercise and build that up. I don't know if you say the same, Jodie. Uh, yeah, very, very similar. So laparoscopic yeah. surgery. So your surgeon's normally fine for you to do anything you want after a few days. Yeah. Uh, getting back to usual mobility is absolutely key the night of surgery yeah up to ward off all, all the kind of complications and get that gut motility going two to three weeks after surgery you can start thinking about resuming your normal activities going back to work and as you're doing that that's when you can ease back into perhaps things you were doing or perhaps things you've wanted to do so swimming around that time is fine um even though some of our surgeons sometimes say yeah you can do everything i'm a little bit more cautious i'd rather you not be doing weightlifting or contact sports for the first six months after surgery yeah same as us <laughs> agree yeah Thank you. Um, so another really common question that we see. So um, how long after surgery would, should somebody try to conceive? We've got specific questions around IVF, uh, but how long after surgery until somebody could resume their IVF or should be looking to, to fall pregnant? Well, I can so, answer that based on the recommendation. We have this recommendation really internationally as well as our sort of our um, sort of national body that represents a lot of the bariatric surgeons. The issue if you fall pregnant too soon following um, weight loss surgery is there's re reduced nutrition coming to you, yes, but also reduced nutrition going to a placenta. So we recommend 18 months minimum before you conceive. And that therefore means a couple of things. The first thing is to ensure that you are using a form of contraception that doesn't necessarily rely on gut absorption, even though gut absorption for even oral contraceptives is probably reliable. We recommend consideration of implants, depot, intrauterine devices, um, uh, you know, barrier methods as an alternative rather than relying on an oral tablet form. The question, of course, is, well, why? Why not? You know, you know, a lot of people are going through IVF. They've been waiting forever to get the weight down, to wait for that jump in their fertility. And that's a massively stressful period of time to go through. And they can't wait to be in that position. And we fully understand that. We've looked after many patients who are facing that dilemma. The problem is the evidence shows that the developing fetus and then the baby is potentially risking being born earlier, so preterm delivery, or being smaller for gestational age. So on those grounds, the safety of the pregnancy can't be guaranteed. So our, you know, our, our line really echoes many other centres around the country, which is 18 months, please, before you, before you consider it.
we keep losing your sound, Stevie. We have to get you to talk twice. Um, there's a sulfur, sulfur echo that as well. So we say um, ideally 12 to 24 months, the scientific data we looked at um, and some of the papers we produced ourselves um, would, would actually recommend the 24 months. But we understand that from 12 months, if you've done this to improve your fertility, um, that people are usually pretty keen. Um, and that's a little message out there for all women of childbearing age. Um, so uh, please be aware that with rapid weight loss, you can find yourself more fertile. So you really need to think about your contraceptive methods. We prefer you to think of things that aren't an oral route because we can't tell you that you're going to get that 98% efficacy anymore from that oral, oral contraceptive pill. Um, so you do need to think about things like that as well. We advocate the Marina Coil. It has wonderful benefits for women and there's been um, really good evidence that it's also helpful for us in deterring endometrial cancer. So that's a fantastic um, contraception to use as well. So yes, there's just a little warning out there if you're not planning to have babies. <laughs> And you're going to have to do take two on that, Stevie. <laughs> no, no. Can you hear me now? Yep. I feel there's just something wrong with my computer. Maybe it's tired. Um, so the next question is around polycystic ovary syndrome. So which technique would work best for PCOS? Um, would I lose the same amount of weight as somebody without PCOS? Um, Grace says, I'm only asking because her body is quite resistant to dieting and exercising. So even when she reduces calories and does a lot more exercise, um, she might lose a little bit of weight, but then feels it stops. Anybody? <laughs> yeah, I think for, for there's no specific procedure linked to the uh, polycystic uh, ovary syndrome okay it depends about the the uh, whether a bypass or sleeve can uh, can improve the health issues associated with the with the uh, with the weight that is secondary to the polycystic ovarian syndrome so there are other factors to consider to choose which suitable but uh, the polycystic ovary syndrome per se does not affect the choice of the operation, whether it is sleeve or a bypass or a single joint bypass. Okay, but the weight loss itself with a, with, with, about after any of these options would help with the symptoms. Yeah, personally at Castle Hill, we've had at least a handful of patients that have had um, polycystic ovarian syndrome and um, successfully got pregnant. So that's really positive and they're delighted with that. So bring their babies back in, some probably a little bit too early that they got pregnant, like Jody said and Mr. Pellen. But um, yeah, they have been successful with their quest and getting babies. Thank you. Try again. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Um, Tom, this one's directed to you. Um, what does the diet look like immediately post-surgery? Uh, yeah. So it does vary a little bit from centre to centre, exactly the timings of the, of the advice. But um, at Castle Hill, we, we start patients off um, fairly quickly onto liquid diet, um, including kind of things like um, milk, uh, smooth yogurts, very runny porridge um, and then we move patients on from there onto uh, what I like to call fork mashable textures so things like uh, stews, casseroles, uh, lumpy soups, uh, scrambled eggs that sort of thing. Um, even things like baked beans tend to go down quite well at that stage uh, or even things like uh, fish in sauce so fish pie, cottage pie, shepherd's pie those sorts of things go down well. And then we move from there back on towards solid foods. And what I always tell people is it's not a it's it's not a, a strict transition. It's not a you know on day X you'll be eating this and on day Y you'll be able to tolerate this. It's a, it's a there's a transition there. So you know you'll find that that it gets easier as you go on it to eat more solid foods. Um, and the timings that we give are minimums and they're a guide. So if you find you're struggling, you can always go back a little bit and move forward a bit more slowly. And eventually what we're aiming for is a, a around approximately a tea plate size portion of food, about yay big, about half of which being protein and the rest of it split up between carbohydrates and vegetables. Thanks Tom. Thanks Tom. 
thank you. Um, so this this is a good question. Is there any support for families in terms of supporting you with surgery emotionally? Um, it must be hard for families. So is there anything out there that you guys are aware of to support that family unit? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> so um, I, I think if... Um, so I'm with the Castle Hill team, so I'm talking mm. to when people are going for surgery and, and after surgery. Um, it wouldn't be, what we wouldn't look at, I suppose, is working directly with the family, but we are able to sign posts. So what I suppose we'd expect is that the, the person who's had the surgery um, would ask to speak to us and um, I would try and link people in with other services there. So if they're if they're looking for something specific i might offer a, a, a joint session with sort of um, the person who's had the surgery and their partner or family members just to sort of talk about some of the worries and concerns but it probably would just be a one-off one-off session with the patient if the family member was sort of struggling in their own right i'd probably sign post to local talking therapy services yeah so do yeah. a little bit of the the knowledge about the the sort of specific bariatric bit of it that would sit with me and then general stuff be signposted out yeah so with a more like when you're doing any one-to-one -one therapy if clients are really struggling with family being on board with the process or, or understanding of the process that they're going through in terms of the lifestyle change journey before surgery then i will do a one-off again with with a partner or a family member if they're really struggling and need that but it is a one-off um, and then it would be a case of again signposting out um on referral to the service and um in readiness to meet our team you'll send some virtual uh, you'll send some email information that has videos and booklets and a checklist of everything we think you should know before proceeding with surgery and then you're invited to a team session which means you can it's a q a based on all that information that you can bring anyone with you to and that's an opportunity there then for people's mums or uh, anyone else to ask questions hopefully now with covid restrictions lessening it means that you can bring that loved one with you to come and meet the surgeon and the medic and so on in person so that should hopefully be happening again um, after surgery it's difficult to access post-operative support and um, we have post-operative support groups and, and people are welcome to bring partners and friends there if they wish to and um, it's more of an open forum but that kind of one-on-one -on -one, um is, is is logistically challenging for an nhs service to provide and um, so again i guess that's something that you're thinking about as you're considering your surgery because ultimately we do have to look out for ourselves we are um we do support is very important to us but i guess when you're making this decision you're making this alone for you and um, so that's something else i guess when you're working up and you're spending this time in your weight management service and so many people spend a lot more time in weight management these days uh, because of delays and so on and um, that's something you, you really want to address then that if you're going for this you have that support you need and if you don't know how you're going to handle that as well and again um tom and i see the patients post-operatively in joint clinics so if there was individual specific um areas that we need to address we'd be happy to meet with the the relative and talk through any particular issues and we can sometimes do bespoke work which we have done with i can think of a couple of patients and their relatives so and I, I like to think that you're all a bit like Gogglebox right now, that you're sat in your living rooms and you've got all your relatives and friends there and they're all listening to this and thinking about it as well. So th this first Wednesday of every month is really important to feel that you touch base, that you're part of something and anyone else you want to be part of that journey with you can come to these as well. <laughs> um, I was going to say that we will, I will share all of the, previous recordings of the sessions in the chat and um, you know utilize those and um, watch them with your family with your friends you know get them to understand what the surgery is going to entail what your life might look like afterwards make sure you know they understand how they can support you uh, but they're more than welcome to come to these sessions with you that's you know absolutely fine and um, so the next question is what or who determines which surgery type would be most suitable for an individual I think I'll let the surgeons take that one yeah it's uh yeah it's a it's a shared 
decision. It's not one man, uh, one man decision. So uh, it depends on on patient factors uh, that and uh, and patient. Uh, what 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 do they wish? Well, because that's why we talk about uh, different uh, different options, and what does the patient prefer? Some patients that have. Uh, absolute contraindication to a certain procedure or uh, factors that may put him at risk under risk, put the patient under risk uh, if they go under uh, if they undergo a certain procedure. So, for for example, we don't we don't do a bypass for smokers, okay, because of the risks associated uh, of complications at the joint secondary to the smoking. Uh, we don't do. We don't do a sleeve gastrectomy for patients who struggle of significant symptoms of acid reflux because there would be a, a significant risk of increase of these symptoms. Okay, so the patient when they when they read when they have an idea about different uh, options. Okay, they come with with an idea about the procedure and we offer them the procedure that's more suitable uh, for them based on the on the on their factors. Uh, if if a patient uh, is interested to have a, a, a certain procedure uh, specifically, and he doesn't have a contraindication to that. Okay, we go for, uh, for example, if someone someone want to sleeve, uh, someone want to bypass. If they don't have issues uh, that contradict the procedure, we will will go with with the patient request if it is suitable for them. So it's it's a discussion between the surgical team and or the bariatric surgery team and the patient, and it's affected by their wish or the factors that will specify what is best for them. Could I jump in there as well? And just because I've seen in the, the Q&A quite a few questions which are fairly similar, and it does sort of lead into the, the comments made by my colleague. So one classic consideration is you've had previous surgery. For some people, it's been keyhole surgery. The, the minimally invasive nature of that, for example, you've had your gallbladder removed, keyhole surgery, the internal scar tissue is usually quite minimal. So it doesn't really have an impact on your choice of the type of operation you can then potentially have through keyhole or laparoscopic surgery. If you've had um, even a hysterectomy, which a lot of our patients have had, um, all the way up to an open conversion or a large incision surgery for bowel cancer, for a conversion from gallbladder surgery, where it's become more complicated and you've had a larger incision, then we would expect that you will have internal adhesions, scar tissue. Now that can, mo you know, more often than not, um, cause entrapment of some of the loops of the small intestine. Sometimes it can even cause problems with scar tissue around the stomach itself. I've operated on a couple of patients who have had trauma to their abdomen and have had a large operation and the whole of their abdomen cavity has essentially become sealed. A lot of that discussion then comes down to a, a weighing up of, well, hang on, if we're going to do an operation that's going to involve keyhole surgery and that's your preference, we're more likely to have a successful result with keyhole surgery doing the sleeve gastrectomy than we are with the bypass where the chances are if we wanted to get at the intestine we're going to have to very carefully access the abdomen a full big cut through the tummy wall tease away all of that scar tissue which could take a couple of hours potentially increase the risks of injury to the intestine so is that is a complex discussion that the surgeon would have with the patient about their particular operation. So that that that's just a reference to previous operations sometimes influencing the choice. We often in our in our practice we often say to patients, look, we're going to aim for the bypass. That's your desire, and that's what we've agreed. But what would you say to us having a plan B? You know, if we get into the, the surgery and we find that we simply cannot safely get your small intestine up through keyhole surgery which way do you want us to go we have a preemptive chat do you want us to carry on keyhole and potentially do the sleeve successfully through keyhole surgery or is it the bypass just the bypass nothing but the bypass and in that case we're then committing to doing a larger operation and a bigger incision on the patient so we have that discussion with our patients before often with a quite a detailed um, sort of preparatory consent form to stimulate that discussion. So that's about previous surgery. Second thing is reflux. A lot of questions on the Q&A are about historical diagnosis of a hiatus hernia or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now we know that the gastric bypass is actually quite an effective 
surgical treatment for gastroesophageal reflux. The reason why, without getting into too much technical detail, is not surprisingly because you have got a much smaller stomach that produces a lot less acid. Okay, so that's yeah. one reason because we're partitioning the stomach. Whereas the converse to that thinking is that we kind of thought, well, you know, if you're going to make the stomach smaller, the pressure in that stomach goes up, so reflux goes up. Ooh, sleeve must be a bad option. Neither of those are true anymore, okay, is the bottom line. So that is a discussion between yourself and your surgeon because the traditional fears that sleeve always makes reflux worse and bypass always makes it better are not founded because there's other factors in play such as the anatomy up just in the diaphragm which is the bit you know the little that's the sheet of muscle through which your gullet passes normally so if your stomach has slipped up in the wrong place that is a hiatus hernia now really that needs to be corrected at the time of surgery and brought back into the correct position to give you the best outcome whether it be a bypass or a sleeve and having addressed that at the time of surgery often you get good results for both patients okay yeah there's always going to be some people who may develop a recurrent hiatus hernia or may develop late reflux symptoms down the line but what we see more commonly is that they both don't and that as they lose weight their reflux gets better anyway because the pressure in the tummy reduces and the tendency towards gastroesophageal reflux improves but you know nothing is 100 percent certain but that's another consideration for those people who think well hang on i've got a history of reflux the bottom line is that's a that's a discussion with your surgeon about that thank you thank you <laughs> Sorry, it's really frustrating having to speak twice. So one last question and then we'll have kind of close in for the session. OK, so um, the last question is, if you're going through a cancer treatment, is bariatric surgery still an option for you? Um, I'll potentially start with that. That obviously depends. There's a, there's a myriad of, of unfortunate you know, challenges going through a diagnosis and treatment for a cancer diagnosis. And one thing before you even start a weight loss journey is it's pretty psychologically challenging to go through it anyway, all right? So if you've got that on your plate, you know, to decide, then going through something else like going through a cancer treatment um, experience is really going to make you want to have a discussion with your team about whether you feel like you're in the right place for it because you need to be going into it with your full concentration on what those lifestyle changes are going to be what the changes are at home what your workplace changes are going to be what your body's going to be going through now if you're going through the cancer treatment as well or diagnoses and therapies operations we would usually guide a patient towards a decision to complete that journey first before undergoing weight loss surgery. However, there are some exceptions, most notably those patients in whom an operation to be performed for cancer might require access to their tummy cavity and their specialists feel, hang on a tick, we're not gonna get away with this operation as safely unless we bring their weight down first. And therefore we get involved beforehand, before that process. Um, so it is very much an individual situation for those patients but they're sort of from our experience I would say but you know I welcome any thoughts from anybody else but it, broadly I think they're the main considerations we have. No, no other comments okay no other comments there Okay, thank you so much for all your answers and thanks to everybody for all of your questions. Um, I think that's been a really great session. I just want to say thank you to everybody that's um, been sat on the panel. That's been brilliant. And people have sent some really nice messages through. I think they've really appreciated you taking the time to talk to them tonight. So thank you for that. As always, Jody, thanks very much for making the session happen. Um, and hopefully we'll see all of you again next month on the first Wednesday of the month at half six.